Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. Phoenix Colden wanted to spread her wings. After being homeschooled for years, she was ready to be out on her own. When she was 18, she entered college at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and moved out of her parents' house. After a few years of freedom, her junior year found her back in her family's deeply religious household, and Phoenix began to flounder. On December 18th, 2011, she left home and got into the Chevy Blazer that she was sharing with her parents. She made a phone call, drove off, and never returned. After over a decade of Phoenix's family trying to get law enforcement and media to pay attention to her case, all that has been uncovered is the fact that Phoenix was living a life that very few people knew about. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Phoenix Colden. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. everyone welcome back thank you for joining us once again i'm kona and i'm ethan and we're the husband and wife team behind this podcast each week i tell you the story of an unsolved missing persons case ethan doesn't know anything about the story going into the episode and he is here to provide his reactions and questions in real time hopefully asking some of the same ones you have at home so this week we are back in the u.s we are covering the bizarre case of phoenix colden Her story didn't get much attention back in 2011, but a 2018 Oxygen documentary revealed a lot of bizarre information and turned what little everyone had already thought they knew about the case on its head. So is this going to be another one of those cases where law enforcement doesn't do anything because she's an adult? Yes. And her family believes that her case didn't get a lot of media attention because she's a young black woman. Uh. So, you know, her mom said something to the effect of like, you know, she didn't get nearly the amount of attention that Natalie Holloway got, of course, when she famously went missing in Aruba. It is interesting because sometimes that also has to do with the amount that the parents push. And we talked about that. We released the Jennifer Kessie episode last week. And that's a situation in which her dad like really, really went out there and really like drummed up media attention and, you know, did all of these things. But his daughter was also a gorgeous white woman. And the Colden family, they were doing all of that. Like they were out on the streets, like talking to people, trying to get interest in their daughter's case. And it just didn't happen for a while. There were a few news articles I found, but not much at all. It really, like I said, wasn't until this 2018 Oxygen documentary that I think the case became a little bit more well-known. And what was uncovered in that documentary is, you know, like I said, there were so few facts known about this case, and several of them were proven to be wrong. So it's, it's almost as though seven years in, they're almost starting from zero. Well, I'm really interested to hear this. Yeah, it's definitely a confusing one. So let's get into the story of Phoenix Colden. Phoenix Lucille Colden was born Phoenix Lucille Reeves on May 23rd, 1988 in California to Goldia Colden. I haven't seen any information about Phoenix's birth father, but it seems as though Goldia was unmarried when Phoenix was born. Reeves is Goldia's maiden name. Goldia married Lawrence Colden when Phoenix was just a baby, it sounds like and he adopted her. The family eventually moved from California to Spanish Lake, Missouri for Lawrence's job. Goldie and Lawrence were deeply religious and raised Phoenix in a very strict environment. They attended church regularly where Phoenix played in the handbell choir. Goldia also homeschooled Phoenix and worked hard to make her into a well-rounded ladylike child. 
just to give you an idea of the type of household this was in that oxygen documentary I mentioned, Goldie has said that she taught Phoenix that ladies do not cross their legs because it reveals too much of their private areas. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like she was going through, you know, in an in interview for the documentary, like all of the things that she taught Phoenix and that was one. And she also put an emphasis on being quiet and obedient. Mm. Phoenix did have neighborhood friends, but she apparently wasn't really allowed to go to their houses. One friend said that they would hang out on Phoenix's porch and, and things like that. You know, it really seems as though her parents were like afraid of her falling in with the wrong crowd and really just wanted to have a lot of control over who she was with. Right. Yeah. You know, but Phoenix did make friends in all of her various activities in addition to playing handbells in church, Phoenix also played violin, guitar, and piano. Oh, what, like where did she take those lessons? Or So I'm not sure um, about guitar and piano. The Colden family did have a piano in her, their home, but Phoenix was taking violin lessons from a church friend. But this church friend also happened to be the second chair violinist with the St. Louis Orchestra. Oh, well, okay then. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. So like Phoenix was multi-talented. She was incredibly smart, you know, athletic, musically inclined, just overall very gifted. She also became interested in fencing. So she liked to play basketball. I don't think she ever really played basketball like on teams. I think that was just more of, you know, just shooting hoops with like cousins and stuff like that. But she became interested in fencing and was immediately good at that, advancing all the way to become a regional junior fencing champion. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I know. Like it's, it's, yeah, she had a lot of accomplishments. So it sounds like Goldia started homeschooling Phoenix like when she was in middle school. I think she might have gone to public elementary school and started being homeschooled in the sixth grade. Okay. Though I only read that in one source, so I'm not entirely sure. But, you know, once she was in high school, she like wanted to be in high school and kind of do those high school things like go to prom and all of that. But Goldia was not having it. I have read, and I said this in the intro, that when she was 18, she was able to enroll in college and move away. But, you know, by the time this all happens, it's her junior year and she's 23. So I'm not exactly sure about this timeline. I don't know if she actually started a little bit later, if she took some time off in the middle or or what's happening. I haven't read anything that explained that. But when she did graduate high school and, you know, get her certificate. She enrolled in college at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, which was nearby. Now, she also managed to convince her parents to co-sign an apartment lease so she could live off campus with a friend. Is it safe to assume that this friend is uh, like a fellow from church or somebody of that nature? Because I feel like with how overprotective and controlling her parents were that maybe they wouldn't let her just live like with like a friend from college. Right. You know, that's what I would think too. That's why this whole thing is very bizarre because what her parents didn't know and wouldn't find out until much later was that the friend she was living with was actually her boyfriend. Oh yeah. So I don't know how she managed that. Wow. Yeah. That's, um, that's some deception there. Yeah. But the secrecy becomes a recurring theme in Phoenix's story. Not much has been said about her first few years in college. Like I said, I mean, the timing, I don't know. I just I, I just really don't know much at all. But by her junior year in 2011, things definitely began to change. Phoenix's parents were paying part or all of her rent on that, you know, apartment they co-signed for. And they decided that the expense was just too great. You know, the the campus wasn't too far from their home. And so they're like, listen, we don't want to pay for this anymore. You can move back home. Which if she's been living with her boyfriend, that's probably not going to go over well with them. Right. And I get the feeling from the documentary and just watching the interviews with Goldie and Lawrence that there may be a lot about the circumstances surrounding all these events that they're leaving out. They seem like very private people. And I think the idea of 
having, you know, it's it was a reporter and an investigative reporter and a retired police chief who did this documentary. And I think that they really struggled with the idea of wanting to do it to get Phoenix's name out there for people to know about her case. They struggled with wanting that, but then also not wanting a billion strangers in their business. Right. And for, you know, podcasters like us to be speculating on their home life, you know? And so I think it was really tough for them. And and you see it a lot in the documentary, in her interviews, that like it really does feel like she's holding things back. So I think that there might be a little bit more to the story of why Phoenix had to move home other than they just didn't want to pay the rent anymore. Like maybe they knew about the boyfriend? Yeah, or maybe found, they found, found out, out or there was, you know, they found about other stuff going on in her life. I, I don't know. I just don't think that the public explanation, which is we didn't want to pay for it anymore, is the full story. Mm-hmm. By the time she began her junior year, she was home. And so she moved back into the family house, I believe, in May of 2011. So like right basically at the end of her sophomore year. Now, going from experiencing freedom back to the rigid rules of her parents' house was obviously difficult for Phoenix, as it would be for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. She was used to having privacy, and it was difficult for her to give that up. Phoenix began to clash with her parents, just basically getting into arguments about everything. She still did what was asked of her, but it was tense. For instance, she still attended church with her parents every Sunday, which she also continued to do while she was at school and living at the apartment. Really? Yeah. Like the whole time she still went to church every Sunday, like, you know, she at least did that. But, you know, now she would go, but like she would wait in the car during fellowship hour afterwards. Mm, So it's kind of like, I'll go, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm still in the handbell choir, but like, I'm not going to stand around and talk to these people and eat cookies. She would also retreat to the car often to talk on the phone as it was the only place around the home. She felt like she actually had privacy. So it was very normal for her to just go out into the driveway, sit in the car and make phone calls. Probably to her boyfriend. Yeah, and other friends and just, you know, anyone. On Sunday, December 18th, 2011, Goldia was feeling hopeful. Yes, Phoenix had skipped fellowship hour after church, but as they were driving home, Phoenix told her mother that she wanted things to go back to the way they used to be. She didn't want to fight anymore. And this was the answer to Goldia's prayers. She finally thought that she was getting her daughter back. When they returned home, Phoenix changed out of her church clothes and into a hoodie and sweatpants. Sometime between 2.20 and 3 p.m., reports vary on this, Phoenix's father said that she walked by him and left the house without a word. She went into the driveway, sat in the car, and appeared to be talking on her phone. As she normally did. Exactly. So that's why it wasn't super weird that she just, like, walked out of the house, you know? Yeah. But she then backed out and drove away without telling anybody where she was going. So what was their reaction to that? Well, so I think it struck them as like a little rude, yeah, but not alarming, right? So they just figured she had like gone out to the store or over to a friend's house real quick. Like they just thought that, you know, she went to go make a phone call and then went to go just do something quickly. They weren't super concerned, but she didn't come back. It was evening time and she's still gone. Then it was after midnight and there was still no sign of her. Goldia became so concerned that she was unable to sleep. Despite their recent issues and like the, you know, bickering and fighting and whatever, Phoenix almost never stayed out past midnight. And even though she was a 23-year-old woman, Phoenix's parents still insisted on a 1 a.m. curfew. Oh, okay. House rules, not age rules. Exactly. All right. And Phoenix had only ever broken that rule once, And she came home at 120. Okay. So, yeah, when it's, you know, past midnight and she's not there, then, you know, it's one o'clock. She's not there. Like, Goldia's like, this is not good. She's literally never done this before. So when the next morning came and Phoenix had officially stayed out all night long, Goldia began to panic. 
She started calling around to Phoenix's friends, but no one had heard from her. They called hospitals, but no one matching Phoenix's name or description had been admitted. That afternoon, they went down to the police station and tried to report her missing, but... At, she's 23. She's yep. an adult. She can leave the house when she wants. Yes, and she had been gone less than 24 hours. Right. And, you know, she they saw her leave on her own volition. Right. You know? So there's no weird abduction or anything like that. Exactly. They know she wasn't, like, snatched out of the, her bedroom or anything crazy like that. Now... While the police weren't super interested in, you know, filing a missing persons report for her, they did run the Blazers license plates. To see if it like hit on traffic cameras or or just. I don't think it went that far, but I mean, but yeah, but basically to see if it had been in an accident or, you know, pulled over or anything like that. Sure. Right. But nothing came up. What the Coldens wouldn't find out for a few more weeks was that Phoenix's car had, in fact, been found by police, just in a different jurisdiction. In the final weeks of December, Phoenix's family searched for her. They talked to everyone she knew. They went to the stores and the restaurants that she frequented. They handed out flyers, but they heard nothing from her. Police weren't very helpful at this point, and neither was the media. Phoenix's case simply wasn't deemed urgent or interesting enough to warrant more attention. It wouldn't be until January 2nd, 2012, that the Coldens would receive any clues in their daughter's disappearance. That's when a family friend driving by an impound lot in nearby East St. Louis, Illinois, saw Phoenix's Chevy Blazer. How far away is this town? This was all very confusing because, you know, she's in Missouri and they kept on saying East St. Louis, East St. Louis, without mentioning that it's East St. Louis, Illinois, Illinois. which I had never heard of in my entire life. Yeah. So it was across state lines, but only about 25 minutes away. Okay. After this family friend apparently saw the blazer in this impound lot in East St. Louis, Illinois, they called police there and they basically found out that the car had been towed. So they were able to get a hold of the police report in which Officer Kendall Perry with East St. Louis Police wrote that the blazer had been abandoned in the middle of the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue at 527 p.m. on December 18th, just hours after Phoenix left her home. So she left to home between 2.20 and 3 p.m. The car was found by police two and a half to three hours after that. And that's just when the officer got there. So like, who knows how long it had actually been there? I'm kind of curious as to where, like what the, um, the geography is of that, that block. Cause that's, that's a pretty quick response for police to deem a vehicle abandoned and have it towed. Well, it was in the middle of the road. Oh yeah. It wasn't like parked or on the side of the road or anything. It was like in a turn lane, I think. Oh, oh shit. That's different. Yeah, exactly. So yes, it was very quick. Like he saw nobody and they got it on the truck. Wow. Now, Officer Perry ran the plates and the car didn't turn up stolen. So at 6.23 p.m., it was towed to a nearby impound lot. But they didn't want to take the effort to try and find the owners? Yeah, apparently not. Even though the registration and all of the information was in the glove compartment And the car was registered to Phoenix's parents, not to Phoenix. So it's not as though it was in Phoenix's name. They tried to contact Phoenix, couldn't get a hold of her. And then that's why it was in the impound lot. It had her parents' name on it. They could have easily been reached. Yeah. But they weren't. They were just like, well, it's not stolen and just stuck it in the impound lot. Yes. Like, I can understand that, again, if if that car was on the side of the road or had been on the side of the road for a while, whatever it's deemed abandoned. Right. Because clearly it hadn't been moved or whatever, but like to find a car in a travel lane, Mm -hmm. quote unquote abandoned, like that's to me, that would warrant a little bit more investigation. Yeah. And it gets even weirder. So we'll talk about 
why this is even more bizarre in just a second. But okay, so basically, it's January 2nd, they find the car, they connect it to Phoenix. Now, police in St. Louis County, where Phoenix lived, so the ones who took the missing persons report, now they're kind of interested. They're like, okay, well, we found this car right in a very bad part of town, you know, across state lines. Like, okay, maybe something's Abandoned going on here. in a travel lane. Exactly. Uh, so they get the car, they process it. But I don't know to what extent they processed it. So I do know that they dusted for prints, and all they found were Phoenix and her parents. Mm, interesting. Yeah. There were several of Phoenix's personal items inside of the car, and those are just given to the family. Okay. The, uh, any any idea of what those items were? They weren't documented anywhere? Well, yeah, and they weren't all documented, but some of them were. And actually, I don't even know if the police actually documented them. I know because in the documentary, Goldia had them in a bag and then dumped them on the, ba- the bed to like show the people making the documentary. So we do know what's in there. Like we have video of it. But yeah, so getting to why, like, so yes, that's, that is what it is. Now, the car is the main piece of evidence in Phoenix's case. And it is also, as you are starting to tell, the most confusing. Now, the confusion begins with the delay. Basically, even though the car was found only 25 minutes away from Phoenix's home, it was across state lines. And the lack of a connection between the vehicle and Phoenix's case basically came down to a lack of communication between two police departments. Uh After the car was found abandoned, it did make both police and media start to pay attention. And this is where something weird happened. In all of the early media reports, it was said that the car was found abandoned in the middle of the road with the driver's side door open and the engine running. (laughs) Okay, like... That's really, if that, if the car was found that way, that is like really suspicious circumstances. Yes. I mean, you're talking carjacking, kidnapping. Exactly. What the hell happened there? Right. So this is, if you read any story about this case up until 2018, that is what is said. Car was running in the middle of the road, door open. Now, What we do know, because these items were given to Phoenix's parents, is that Phoenix's glasses, purse, ID, and a pair of shoes were also inside the vehicle. Now, I do not think that the shoes were what she was wearing when she left the house. Because remember I said she changed into like a hoodie and sweatpants? Yeah. yeah. The shoes that were found were like ballet flats. Uh, Okay. Yeah. So my guess is it was just an extra pair of shoes she kept in the car. And we don't know what the contents of the purse were. No, not really. Uh, but her ID was in it. I'm assuming it was in the purse. It was in the car. Sure. So yeah. either way. Um, cell, her, phone, cell phone not found? I, no, the cell phone was not found. Okay. All right. So getting back to, okay, if this is how the car was found... It does seem absurd that a police officer would come across the scene and just impound the car without a word to anyone. Right. Yeah. They'll just file it as as abandoned property and leave it at that. Like a normal person would obviously assume that something bad had happened. Like you said, a carjacking, a kidnapping, you know, all of the above. But Officer Perry apparently did not think this. Now, it also didn't help that when the media started to run with the story, East St. Louis police wouldn't respond to requests for comment. Of course they wouldn't. It's like, <laughs> why, why, why would they want to be like, yeah, we found the car like that. Right. So. It didn't do anything. Yeah. Now, because of this, this, like I said, is the narrative that persisted for years. But then in this 2018 documentary, investigative reporter Shandrea Thomas and retired deputy police chief Joe D'Elia were able to get an on-camera interview with Officer Perry. Oh, shit. Okay. He took them to the location where he found Phoenix's car, which was in a crime-ridden area of East St. Louis. But when he described what he found, his description was much different than what had been reported. According to him, when he came across the car, the engine was not running and the doors were shut and locked. 
Nothing inside looked to be amiss. When he approached the vehicle, his assumption was that the driver had like run out of gas or had some other mechanical issue, which is why they stopped in the road. Now, I'm curious, was this his description or did the interviewers in the documentary press him for specifics on the car? Like, did they say, did they leave it as an open-ended question? Like, how did you find the car or, or was it like, well, so it was, it was both. So he, it was open-ended. He explained what he had found and then, you know, he's like, yes, the car was in this lane and then we call the, the tow truck basically. And then they're like, and then she said, was the car running? He was like, no. And she said, was the door open? He was like, no, it was locked. Like, I just thought they ran out of gas. Yeah, I'm just I'm just curious if, if that um, like he was already on the defensive about it because because that story had been running and yeah, maybe, maybe he caught some flack for for doing that. I'm wondering, too, like the whole thing is very odd to me because, you know, I've read a couple of things that that characterize this as him changing his statement. But I don't know if he originally said that the car was running or if right. or where that came from. Yeah. And Shandrea Thomas, after this whole thing, she went back to Goldie and Lawrence and they're like, she's like, yeah, so Officer Perry says that the car wasn't running. Like, where did you get that information from? Because she, um, Shandrea Thomas, was one of the first reporters locally who covered the case. Okay. And she was like, everything I know about this, every report I've done on this case has said that the car was running. So she asked Goldie, she's like, where did you get that information from? And she's like, I, I don't know. I don't remember where that came from. Interesting. That's really interesting because yeah, you're right. He, the officer Perry might not have changed his statement because there probably was never a statement taken. If he found the car like that and just impounded it. Like, I mean, there was a report. Sure. But, but yeah, he may not have taken note of whether the engine was running or, or, Right, but he, I mean, if it was running, like he definitely should have said that. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, you know, if he found the car with the engine run, running running in the and the door open, you would think that that would have been in the report. Right, and I don't know if it was, and then the report got changed, and then his statement. I I yeah. I don't know. That's right. why it's so bizarre. So that could that could have been, even though that is a very specific detail, that could have been something that was, um misrepresented or misunderstood by yeah, from, a reporter and it got put or, out as that or, or by the family by the family or or somebody yeah which i mean still not great on officer perry like not taking any effort to right notify the owners of the car but it does change the circumstances yeah drastically so instead of a violent abduction like police and phoenix's family they didn't really know what they were looking at yeah they still had no idea where phoenix went when she left her house or what she was doing during the time she was out before the car was found because again like we're probably looking at a couple of hours here and you know because we don't know exactly when the car was left right just when it was found right and if it only takes 25 minutes half hour at most yeah do we there's no ties to that neighborhood that her parents know about no so we don't know if that was like a friend from college lives in that area or what she what no, she would have no. been doing and in in the years since like none of her friends have said like oh yeah she was probably there because of x y and z like nobody boyfriend who has yeah nobody who has come forward yeah i should say yeah has given any tie between phoenix and that area interesting they don't know how the car that got there or why or who left it? Did Phoenix drive it there and leave it? Did she drive it there and still get abducted? Right. You know, did somebody dump it there? Nobody knows. Wait, I'm sorry. Did they find car keys? That is a good question. And it's not explicitly said one way or the other if they did. Right. I don't think they did. If the car was found with the engine off and the doors closed and locked, that doesn't scream abduction or anything or like a carjacking or anything like that because like if you're carjacking somebody and abducting them you're not going to take the time to close and lock the doors right yeah exactly what it does i mean it gives credence to what officer perry said if you find the 
door is closed and locked and the key's gone, yeah, then it makes sense that you would think that the person ran out of gas or had an issue, closed and locked the doors, took the keys and went to go get help or whatever. Yeah. When Goldie and Lawrence found out that, you know, the car was in East St. Louis, like they had to obviously start looking into people who are close to Phoenix and then also the area. I mean, they didn't know why the car would have been there. So they went themselves on foot talking to drug dealers, talking to sex workers, like just trying to find anybody who had seen Phoenix, who knew anything. And they did that for months and handed out flyers but didn't really find anything out. But what her parents did find out early on was that Phoenix had been hiding aspects of her life from them. The first thing that they found out... The boyfriend. Yeah, it was the boyfriend, apparently a guy named Mike B. Now, the Coldens reached out to Mike, but as of May 2012, five months after Phoenix was last seen, he wouldn't speak with them. Did the police interview him? Yes, I don't know exactly when, but okay. the police did interview him. So in in the reason why I say as of May is because the St. Louis Post-Dispatch did an article on Phoenix's case and interviewed her parents, and they told the reporter that they've reached out to Mike. Mike wouldn't talk to them. Uh, the paper reached out to Mike. Mike would not talk to the paper either. At some point... Police were able to speak with him, and they have since publicly stated that they don't consider him to be a suspect in this case. Interesting. Okay. Right. But of course, being police, they haven't given any other details about why they don't suspect him. Right. Other than the fact that he has apparently passed a polygraph. Meaningless. Right. Unless he gave them a solid alibi. Yeah, exactly. We don't know. I mean, they could very easily just say that and that squashes everything, though. But, yeah, you know, because well. that doesn't like they don't have to give his alibi away. They could just be like he provided an alibi. Yeah. Done. Nope. As investigators in the cold ends looked deeper into what was going on in Phoenix's life in the months and weeks leading up to her disappearance, more secrets and odd behavior began to emerge. While Phoenix's cell phone was not found inside of the car, a cell phone bill was. Now, that's not a crazy thing for somebody to have in their car, except for the fact that Phoenix was on her parents' cell phone plan. Okay, so this is another cell phone. Correct. According to her friend Tim Baker, Phoenix got the other phone not to have privacy from her parents necessarily, but because she was talking to another man other than her boyfriend, Mike B. In fact, it's been reported that Phoenix was speaking with several men prior to her disappearance, but Tim only confirmed the one. Her best friend, Akira, also confirmed the second boyfriend. He was also named Mike, and she apparently met him at school. This Mike also worked at a cell phone store and would give Phoenix uh, discounts. Okay, okay. This Mike also refused to speak with the family, and it's unclear whether or not police ever interviewed him. Akira also said that beyond this second sacred boyfriend, Phoenix had been acting strange in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. She was unhappy and paranoid, and it actually caused the friends to get into a fight and stop talking about a week before she vanished. Akira said in the Oxygen documentary, quote, We argued about something stupid. She said I said something about her and her boyfriend. I don't know if she was just trying to scare me, but she carried around a knife. She pulled it out, and I was like, okay, well, are you going to use it? Who are you cutting? End quote. So Joe D'Elia asked her about this knife, and Akira described it as like a dagger. Like, not a pocket knife. <laughs> a dagger? Yeah, I mean, that was the, use, the word that he used. It's not the word that Akira used, but like, she was basically describing like a, you know, a, a fixed blade knife with like a handle, a big knife. Yeah. The entire thing was very bizarre and out of character for Phoenix. Akira also said that Phoenix alluded to wanting to get out of town saying, quote, she was just like, I'm just leaving. I'm just going to pack up my stuff and I'm just going to go. End quote. And Phoenix was paranoid too. Like Akira said that she kept on talking about how like people were after her and, you know, she, she was just jumpy and, and weird in the weeks before her disappearance. 
Are we thinking possible drugs? Yeah, so that does come up as well. Um, and, you know, I don't know what friend said that, but apparently Phoenix had been experimenting with drugs prior to her disappearance, but I don't know, like, the extent of it or, or anything or like that. Type. But yeah, yeah, but yeah, so that apparently fed into it. You know, she was hanging around, like, different groups of people. And, you know, that was one thing that her friend Tim Baker said. It was like, you know, after she disappeared and all this stuff started coming out, he said that he felt like each of Phoenix's friends knew part of her. Mm. But like nobody really knew all well, of her. Yeah. Because the other thing that Tim mentions that, you know, he didn't know about is that the last time he saw her, which was, you know, not too long before she disappeared, they're just like talking about normal stuff, talking about college, talking about this, that, and the other. You know, then all this stuff comes out about like what Akira said about her being paranoid and like having this knife. And then also Phoenix wasn't enrolled in classes for next semester. Oh. But she didn't tell anybody that. She was just acting as though she was going to school next semester as normal. Oh, interesting. So this might be more planned out than we thought. Right. But in the documentary, they also interview one of her friends from the fencing club. And I guess she had kind of stopped being as involved in that. And like, he just saw her two weeks, I think he said before her disappearance. And she was talking about how she wanted to, you know, start it up again and get back to doing competitions. Okay. So still planning for the future, even though it might not have been with school. Yeah. So the the fencing club is not, that's something separate from school. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, so, you know, on one hand, it seems as though she was planning to leave. You know, she had that comment that she made to Akira about like, I just want to pack just up my stuff go. and get out. Yeah. Right. But then she's, she's not enrolled in. And she's, yeah. And she's school. not enrolled in school next semester. But then she's making plans to rejoin the fencing. Yeah. Club. And to do competitions, yeah. which, you know, are local. So it, it's just, it's really hard to say. It really kind of seems like she was all over the place. Yeah. Which drugs would kind of explain part of that. Yeah, depending. Yeah. This starts coming out and Goldie and Lawrence don't know what to think. Phoenix had told her best friend that she wanted to pack up her stuff and get out, but she didn't pack anything up. She left all of her belongings either at home or in the car. Including her ID. Yeah, and her glasses. Right. And who knows whatever else was in the purse. Right, exactly. So was she kidnapped? The initial reports of the car being left running with a door open certainly made it look like a violent abduction, like we said, but finding it turned off and in a bad part of town made it seem more like it was dumped there. Yeah. So if that's the case, was it dumped there by Phoenix or by somebody who took her? But there's no other, I mean, not that it's impossible to drive a car without leaving fingerprints, but there's no other fingerprints other than hers and her parents. Exactly. Now, Goldia and Lawrence were obviously concerned that Phoenix's double life with the men, the drugs, the paranoia, meant that she could have gotten involved in something dangerous or with a group of people who were dangerous. Right. So then there's this location where the car was left. East St. Louis is known for human trafficking, and I-70, which runs through it, has been called the Sex Trafficking Highway of America. Yikes. Quite the dubious distinction. Yeah. So could Phoenix have been abducted by sex traffickers? Now, sex traffickers, regardless of what you see in movies or read in breathless Facebook posts from a woman who is definitely almost sex trafficked at Walmart, they they don't really abduct random people off the street. No, it's usually like grooming and taking their time and, I mean, basically convincing them to go willingly. Exactly. Given what we know about Phoenix and what was going on with her, I think it's very possible that the answer to what happened to her is kind of a combination of all three theories. Her leaving on her own, an abduction, and sex trafficking. Right. Phoenix very well could have started running with the wrong crowd, and it seems as though that probably was the case in to one degree or another. Mm-hmm. She was incredibly sheltered growing up, and could have missed some signs that people had nefarious intentions. Right. And then you introduce the potential of her experimenting with drugs, mm-hmm. 
probably from the same group of people who eventually convince her one way or the other, whether through blackmail or whatever other tools that they could have used to go with them. Yeah. And it is interesting that you bring up blackmail, actually. So one thing that was found in the car was a note, a handwritten note that had been torn up. So Goldie found it. She like put it back together. And initially they didn't think that it was Phoenix's handwriting, but they went back through some of her like school notebooks and saw that it was, it did match her handwriting when she was in a rush. Okay. So like if she was taking notes in class. Yeah. The note was dated December 18th, 2011, the day she vanished. Now Goldie has said that parts of the note, the note were missing, but what they could make out said, quote, we think you need to make up your mind before 2012 or else I will show you what I can do about your parents, end quote. We think you need to make up your mind before, before 2012, 2012 or else I will show you what I can do about your parents. And this was, they believe in Phoenix's handwriting, but they believe that she wrote this down like because it was said to her almost as if she was taking notes. Oh, interesting. You just brought up the word blackmail that blackmail. made me think about that. Yeah. So uh, I I don't know. I mean, was she being threatened by somebody? Right. We think you need to make up your mind. Yeah. By 2012. Yeah. And right. this was the day she disappeared, which was December 18th. Right. Huh. So if somebody did say that to her, to her and she frantically took notes mm -hmm. about it, I wonder what the make up your mind was. Make up your mind, go with somebody willingly. I mean, obviously they wouldn't put it this way, but basically into sex trafficking. I don't know. And the other thing that came out later that could or could not be related is that there were savings bonds in the home, which Phoenix had been taking and it added up to about $2,500. Okay, not a whole lot. Not but. a whole lot, but a little. So, you know, it kind of makes you wonder, like, all right, so she was, like, squirreling this money away. That kind of indicates that maybe she was planning on leaving. But then there's this threatening note, which indicates that maybe... Maybe she wasn't planning on leaving. But maybe somebody... Maybe somebody was Planning something, yeah. So, you know, maybe she met somebody... And, you know, they gave her an opportunity to get out and maybe she wanted to take it, but the actual execution of the plan wasn't what she thought it was going to be. Uh -huh. And that's why she disappeared suddenly instead of packing up her stuff and leaving as she told Akira she wanted to do. Like maybe she did want to leave, but things went wrong. Yeah. Or escalated right. through blackmail faster than she was anticipating. Yeah. Now, a possible sighting of Phoenix in 2014 could bear this theory out. One of Phoenix's friends, who is another church friend, from what I understand, a woman named Kelly Fraunhert swears she saw Phoenix on a Southwest Airlines flight that she was on. Kelly told Oxygen, quote, I was already seated on the flight. There were people still boarding. And I looked up and that's when I saw her. She was with a group of women. She walked right in front of me and I looked at her face and I said, Phoenix? She then said that when she called Phoenix's name, the woman turned to her and said, oh, do I look like someone? And she replied, yes, you do. You look like my friend Phoenix. The woman kept on walking and didn't engage further. Kelly said that she saw this woman with four other women who are young, pretty, and the same physical type as Phoenix. They were also accompanied by two men who, quote, looked like they could be pro football players. Yeah, I mean, this is all matching human trafficking. Right. Now, Kelly was intimidated by these men, and she was doubting herself. Now, keep in mind, this is three years after Phoenix went missing. So, it, like, what are the odds that she's on some random Southwest flight and actually sees her missing friend? So she's, of course, doubting herself, and she's with yeah, these, like, two absolutely. big scary dudes. Yeah. So she didn't pursue the woman further. However, after the plane landed, Kelly went to the Southwest counter and told them that she believed she had seen a missing person on her flight. They called police who searched the airport, but they couldn't find the woman. 
When asked on the documentary how certain she was that this woman was Phoenix on a scale of one to 10, she rated her confidence at a nine. Mm. But okay, so this is what I don't understand. It, you know, it's tougher on Southwest because you don't have seat assignments. Sure. So you could be like, who was the woman sitting in B23 or whatever, 23B? But like, they still have the flight They still manifest. have a manifest, right. Yeah. So they could still kind of cross-reference, I feel like. and Which like they dig, should have. And dig into that yeah. and at least figure and be able to find out who this woman was. And later, maybe not that day. But later, have some investigator say, hey, were you on the Southwest flight? Like, what's yeah. going on? Who, who are you? You know, like, I just feel like there could have been more that was done. And it doesn't seem as though there was. It seems as though it seems as though when airport police couldn't find the woman that day in the airport. They just left it at that. That was it. And like the so, the I original mean, investigating agency didn't get involved. Like the FBI didn't get involved. Like nobody did anything. Yeah, I mean, she could have been traveling under her real name. And if they didn't check the manifest. Yeah. Nobody would know. Because it wasn't an international flight. Like she didn't need a passport or anything. Because, you know, obviously like they've checked, you know, her ID, passport, social, social security number. Like none of that has popped up. Right. But if you use your ID to buy a plane ticket. That's not going to pop up in a database. Exactly. Yeah. On a right. domestic flight. So she could have actually been traveling under yeah. her real name. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't even do the bare minimum. And again, I just don't know what was actually done by police because a lot of this was done by the documentarians and a private investigator that the Coldens hired. They spent within the first six months, they spent like $50,000. Jesus. They spent, they lost their house because they spent all of their money trying to find Phoenix. Wow. Like they live in Arizona now, I think, because the house went into foreclosure and they were able to save it like in the nick of time and actually sell it. And I don't know if it's a short sale, you know, whatever it was, but they were able to sell it and get out. But yeah, like they lost everything financially because they had to do this investigation on their own. It's just, it's just so, it's so wild that there's, so many law enforcement agencies involved and none of them is even taking the slightest extra step. Like airport police, why didn't they contact the the original agency that had it? I mean, maybe they did. Wow. And like, I also feel like at some point, especially when you're dealing with, you know, what I think is a fairly credible sighting, given that this person knew Phoenix and it wasn't just some stranger who's like, oh, yeah, I think I saw this girl who like I saw on Dateline or like yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I think that's a fairly credible sighting. So at that point, you're crossing state lines. Like, is the FBI going to get involved? Like, there's got to be some sort of human trafficking task force somewhere on a federal level that you would think could potentially get involved in this. But anyway, so nobody did. Since the beginning, Phoenix's family has operated under the assumption that their daughter is alive and out there somewhere, which, given the evidence, I think is a fair assumption to make. I would agree. Now, like I said, they hired a pi private investigator, and this guy was named Steve Foster. Other than this possible plane sighting, one of the best leads that they had was found by this private investigator, Foster. Remember... All the way back at the very beginning of this episode, I said that Phoenix was born Phoenix Reeves. Apparently, she had a birth certificate issued in that name. That was her original birth certificate, with a new one being issued once Lawrence Colden adopted her. So where's the original birth certificate? Exactly. No idea. Now, this is good information, but, you know, didn't solve the case, right? It was, however, a new lead of inquiry. Phoenix Colden's identity hadn't been used since December 2011, but what about, what Phoenix, about Reeves? Phoenix Reeves? Yeah. So when Foster searched, he found four people with that name in the United States. Three he was able to immediately eliminate, you know, due to age or race or gender or, you know, whatever. Or death. Exactly. The fourth Phoenix Reeves, however, had no date of birth, no social security number, and no relatives linked to her. There was, however, an address. 
This address was associated with the name Phoenix Reeves from January 2012 to June of 2012. So right after she went missing. Yes, the six months after she went missing. And the address was in Anchorage, Alaska. Oh, wow. That's that's trip. Yep. In the Oxygen documentary, they traveled to Anchorage and found the owner of the home okay. that, you know, that address was. Now, the woman said that she had owned the home since 2002 and had never rented it out, but her son lived there. Now, they didn't talk to the son. They just talked to the woman. And she said that she had never heard the name Phoenix Reeves or Phoenix Colden, and when they showed her a photo, she did not recognize her. Joe D'Elia also canvassed the neighborhood, but none of the neighbors recognized Phoenix either. And, you know, these are neighbors who had been there for years. Yeah. And nobody in the neighborhood said like, oh, yeah, I do remember some girl living there or, you know, anything like that. Like, based on the canvassing that they did, nobody had seen Phoenix or anybody like Phoenix in that neighborhood. So I'm curious how that address popped up. Was it like, you know, like a... a Spokio website or or people finder or something like that. I think it was something like that, but more professional because again, this was done by the private investigator and they have access to sure. different databases. Yeah, but yeah. it was along it was something those like lines. that. Yeah, and so like the background finder, like a data bro- data brokerage or whatever. Exactly. So the background finder app that I have off, you know, also has that. Like sometimes if you look up a name, you won't have all the information, but you will have an address. So. Yeah, it's tough. But it is interesting that the name never popped up again Mm -hmm. after those six months at that one address. And just out of curiosity, I looked for it just now. And this is, you know, several years after this has all happened and I couldn't find it at all. I'm wondering if she used that address with her birth certificate to get an ID. It doesn't sound like it because I feel like that would have popped up, right? Like if there was an ID associated with the name Phoenix Reeves, like it would have popped up in in, in the databases that he was searching yeah. later. So it doesn't sound like it. I'm just wondering how, how it became associated with her then. Basically, an address gets associated with you if you receive mail there. So like if you look at my background report, there are definitely addresses on there that I didn't, live at but like i got mail there for whatever reason like it was my parents house or or something along those lines yeah so that's usually how an address gets associated with you maybe phoenix had something to do with that house maybe she got some form of mail there or maybe it was just a mistake in a database yeah which also happens yeah either way it's a dead end If Phoenix is still out there and a victim of human trafficking, it would make sense that her identity hasn't been used. This is one of the biggest ways that victims stay trapped. According to Covenant House Toronto, Canada's largest agency who assists youths who have been trafficked or homeless, total reliance on the trafficker is a major barrier to exit. The trafficker often provides and controls all of their victims' needs, including love, food, money, or shelter. There are other factors that make it so hard to escape, including lack of trust. Victims often come to believe that the trafficker is the only person that they can trust. And this is compounded by the fact that victims often face judgment from service providers, friends, family, and their community. And this judgment is internalized into shame and self-blame for their current situation. If Phoenix is in a situation like this, she may feel as though her parents' strict religious beliefs may mean that they wouldn't want her back, that she's somehow tainted. But Goldia says that this simply isn't true. She wants her daughter back in her life no matter what has happened over the past decade. Goldia told People Magazine that if she could tell her daughter anything, it would be this. Quote, if you ever get a chance, get away. Run and go for it. Don't be afraid. You'll be safe. End quote. Mm-hmm. 
Phoenix Golden has been missing from Spanish Lake, Missouri since December 18, 2011. She was last seen wearing a black or dark blue hooded sweatshirt, gray sweatpants with the word Lindenwood or the letters USML on one leg, and black sneakers. Phoenix is a black female with brown hair and brown eyes. She was 5'6 and approximately 125 pounds. She was 23 when she went missing. She would be 35 today. Anyone with information regarding Phoenix Colden is asked to contact the St. Louis County Police Department at 636-529-8210. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and thentheywergone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and TikTok. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!